one-way wave equation. Heat equation. And it's called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Okay? And for each of these, we're already, we've been covering these two in detail. And for these two, we, we can say some specific things about when they go ba bad from the von Neumann analysis and when they're okay. And uh, so, in fact, what we want to do is characterize these things um, and actually look at the instabilities when these things actually do, each of them violate CFL numbers. Okay? So a couple things we need. We need how to take derivative and a second derivative. And in particular, this is also related to your homework, you take one derivative, <coughs> remember that, that uses a point in front minus a point in back divided by 2 delta x, and this is really going to give us something like this. This turns out to be a matrix A times U, where U is all the points, A is a differentiation matrix. One derivative of an x. And what does A look like? Well, A looks something like this. Zeros along the diagonals, ones on the off diagonals, minus one on these diagonals. And that's because you have a one on this diagonal, minus one on this diagonal, the one over two delta x comes out front. And then we're going to consider periodic boundary conditions for what we do today. So periodic boundary conditions, this negative one would be over there. This one, instead of it being here, it's over there. Everything else is zero. Okay? But we also need two derivatives in x, which is point in front minus twice the current point plus point behind all over <coughs> delta x squared. And let's call this this second derivative matrix B. And B looks something like this. Uh, 1 over delta x squared negative 2 along the diagonals, 1 on the up diagonals and the bottom diagonals, 0 everywhere else, and then <coughs> periodic boundary conditions gives us that. Okay? So these are the two matrices we need. Why do we need them? Well, when we do the iteration schemes, we're going to calculate these things here. Okay? In particular, let's talk about the iteration scheme. First of all, let's talk about with the one-way wave equation. What were the iteration schemes? Well, we had Euler. Euler scheme was something like this. U of n, m plus 1, was equal to U of n, m, plus lambda over 2, U of n plus 1, m, minus U of n plus minus 1, m. That was the Euler scheme. <coughs> Leapfrog, 2-2, two, two, was exactly the same except for right there, this term right there, you replace it with u of n, m minus 1. <coughs> the only difference between the two. And instead of lambda, uh, lambda over 2, that just becomes lambda. And we know this is stable for lambda less than or equal to 1. Okay, so these we're going to try both these schemes. This is what we derived in class. We're also going to do it for heat equation. Again, Euler, what do you have? U of n, m plus 1 is equal to U of n, m, <coughs> plus lambda, u of n plus 1, m, minus 2, u of n, plus u of n minus 1, m, m. And if you do leapfrog on this, again, uh, factor of 2 different here. So let's say this lambda actually goes to 2 lambda, same thing here. So wherever you see a lambda, you place it by 2 lambda, and wherever you see this term, you place it by this. So this is... So these terms and these terms. Every, everything's the same except for these terms and these terms and these schemes. 
we're going to test these out. Okay? All right. Here we go. We hop up to the computer, and we are going to start with this. Okay. Let's see. Clear all. Uh, close all. Um, this is going to be our basic starting point is with those two commands. Now what we're going to do, you can follow along there in the notes, we got to start building this thing. So first of all, just pick some time we want to solve it for. Uh, I don't know. Let's go for time from zero to four. So usually I'm going to start off at zero and just run it forward into the future. And so four is fine. We can play around with that. It's not a big, it's not a big deal. Um, we have to pick a domain. Twenty. Totally random choice. Twenty sounds just as good as twenty-five or ten. Depends a lot on what your initial conditions are, what you want to do, and also what the behavior is. Okay, so 20 is a, actually not a bad thing to start with, and we have to pick our discretization. How many spatial points do we want when we chop this thing up? Let's go ahead and do just to take consider the notes 200 points. So I'm going to go in this interval from from negative 10 to 10, which is size 20. Um, I'm going to chop it up into 200 points. So let's go ahead and make my domain. Remember, it's periodic boundary condition, so x2 is going to be a linear space which goes from negative l over 2 to l over 2 in n plus 1 points. Remember, the last point of this domain is equivalent to the first. Okay, so I have 200 points I have to solve for, but the 201st point is really the first point because it's periodic boundaries. Okay, and all I want to then solve for is first one through any of those. Okay? Everybody okay so far? All right. What's my dx? Well, my dx now is my distance between points. That's easy to get. I can just basically get dx as the difference between any one of my points here. Okay, so I can say, how about x2 minus x1. If I calculate that, that's giving me what my spatial discretization is. Okay. Remember, with your CFL condition, if we come back up here, the, the key thing we're going to play around with when we do this discretization is this lambda term, which has delta t and delta x's in it. So we have to actually be very careful about how we're going to choose this. And so we have control. Right now, we just picked by doing 200 points, we got a certain dx. Now what we get to do is we get to choose the delta t. OK. So let's, uh, let's do that. dt equals 0 0.2. Let's pick it to be anything. Actually, let's pick it 0.1 right now. Um, and by the way, we want to choose our dt so it's under the CFL condition, right? So for instance, right now, let's just go ahead and run this code. Uh, let's go up here and run it. Save as untitled. So yeah, I love saving things as untitled. <coughs> we ran this thing, and we say, what was our, what was our dx value? 0.1. What was our dt? 0.1. So our CFL number for the one wave, wave equation, remember, the CFL number is equal to dt over dx, which in this case is 1 right now, what we've chosen. Okay, because it's 0 0.1 over 0 0.1. All right? So this is your key parameter here. And you control it by toggling dt around. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and solve this thing. I'm now solving it, remember, from time 0 to time 4 in steps of 0.1. So when I iterate this thing, how many times am I going to iterate it? Well, the number of time steps I'm taking right, is going to be total time divided by dt. 4 divided by 0.1. That tells me the total number of steps I'm taking. 
Okay, let me just close all these up. <coughs> okay. So I'm going to make a time vector, which is going to go from 0 in dt all the way up to time. Time steps is my, so this, well, this will have this, the length of time steps, same number of components as time steps. All right. Okay, I'm kind of ready to go. This is sort of all preliminary stuff, right? Just setting up, what's my domain? What's my time step? All these kind of things have to be set up initially. Now, once you get them set up, now you're ready to actually put in things like, how about, Initial conditions. Okay, well, let's put some in. Uh, I'm going to start off with something simple. Simple meaning, I'm going to send in something like um, a Gaussian. I mean, whatever function you want is fine, but this is uh, not a bad choice, just a little bump. And it's a one-way wave equation, so what happens in a one-way wave equation, if you wave equation, things propagate. So you expect this bump to propagate. Okay? All right, so let's start off here. We'll build from here. First, we're going to do the Euler scheme. Now, the Euler scheme, you just give it an initial condition and go. Okay? So let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. So let's now build the... Uh, so I have the initial condition, and now I'm ready to build the iteration procedure, which is given up on the board. Uh, and the thing you need there is you're going to take a derivative of this thing. Well, so now you need your derivative matrix, which we wrote down up here. Okay? So, derivative matrix. Did I warn you guys about public spelling? If you can avoid it, there's two things you try really hard not to do. Spell in public and do algebra in public. Okay, you are successful if you can get away with both. You, it's just a bad. It's just a formula for disaster. You know, you spell something that everybody in the room knows, and you're like spelled it wrong because you weren't thinking, and then they think you're dumb. Or with algebra, you get yourself in a pickle, and it's like they don't. You, you know, you get yourself in a hole, and you start sweating because you can't work out something that's really easy. Yeah, bad things make you squirm and dream bad things at night. Okay, now here we go. Oh, yeah, derivative matrix. It's a sparse matrix. First, we're going to make it uh, a vector of ones, okay? And what we're going to do with the sparse matrix, so we're going to use the sp diags command, sp diags, and what we're going to do is put, uh, for the first derivative, notice that you have, over here, you have ones and minus ones on there. Okay, so you have basically, um, you have minus E1 on the lower diagonal and E1 on the top diagonal. In other words, negative ones and ones, and their locations on the diagonals is one of them is located at minus one off the main diagonal, the other one's at one off the diagonal, and it's an n by n matrix. That's it. Then the last thing you have to do is say, well, it's periodic boundary condition, so I have this. And I have this. So at the corners, so here, this is the uh, first row nth column. The negative 1 goes over in that spot. This here is the nth row first column. And I have a 1 coming over from, from the 1s. Okay? That guarantees my periodic boundary conditions. That's the reason they're put in there. Continuing with the code. Now we are ready to iterate. <laughs> and how do you iterate this thing? Well, what we want to do, start iterating. We have an initial condition. And we're going to go, f we make a little iteration loop. J goes from 1 all the way to number of time steps. Minus 1, actually, because I'll, sh I'll show you what we do is this always predicts the future point. So since I have initial data, it predicts one point in the future. So if I go to the, I have a total of time steps, points that I want. So 
in the iteration procedure, time steps would give me time steps plus one. So I just need to go to time steps minus one. That gives me time steps plus one. Okay? Now, how do I program this up? Hmm. This is hard part because this is where you have to really think about what you want to program here and the iteration procedure. So we might need a little help from our friends. Oh, I'll help you. First, you've got to iterate this thing. Oh, look, it's Brittany, everybody. Hi, Brittany. I didn't know you knew math. Oh, yeah, I do it all the time in my Malibu house. Well, Brittany, how about if you hang out with us and help us out here with uh, coding? Sure. You can just point at the line we need to work on. She's so smart. Thanks, Brittany, for coming and taking time from your busy schedule. How's the married life, by the way? Oh, we're not divorced yet. So, well, that's good. Well, how about if you sit over in uh, this side over here? You'll be a little distra less distracting. Okay. This is all. I spare no expense to bring you the best visitors from around the world. Brittany's just, you know, she was the only one available today, so. All right, here we go. Ready? What's that? Fridays, yeah, she's available on Fridays. You know, Wednesdays, can't get her. She's all booked up, you know, big concerts and stuff. So, all right. So here we go. Actually, by the way, you have to say, hey, so Brittany, what about your semiconductor guide to physics? Oh, yeah, it's all online. It's really cool to see. In fact, i got to go there now. You guys should check out, do a Google search on Brittany Spears' guide to semiconductor physics. It's hilarious. There's a web page, and it's actually serious science, but then there's, anyway. Go check it out. Yes, Pierre. Are you live on UW TV? Am I live on UW TV? <laughs> yeah. I've always been live on UW TV when she comes on, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But not now. Not anymore. This year, we're not getting, we're not live on UW TV, but everybody else gets to enjoy this. <laughs> it's not quite as fun, because I always like to broadcast that to the world. So, all right. So here we go. Let's make up our little iteration routine. Um, I'm coming in with some initial condition, you not, and I want the future. My future point is the current point, plus CFL condition, right? That's what I have, divided by 2, times A times you not. That's it. That's as easy as that procedure gets. Even Brittany could do that one. Okay. So we're just going to iterate forward. U1 is my new value. And then I could say, well, OK, now once I have this new value, I want to write it to a, um, the next time through this thing, I have to say, well, now U0 is going to be U1. So I'm resetting this thing. <coughs> right? So I come in with U0, I get a new U1. That's going to co come back up to the loop and use it, uh, a U0. The idea is that this new U0 should be what you just calculated. Okay, so that's the two-step procedure. Now let's save the data. My solution, uh, write out the data to a file. Uh, so what I want to do is write out what U1 is to this data. Okay, so the solution, the, the J plus one column solution is going to be I'm writing out U1, the column vector. So by the way, <coughs> when I come up here then, <coughs> first column of my solution vector should be U0, what I started with. Okay? <coughs> by the way, <coughs> see I don't have the cough quite under control, but I'm going to put uh, transpose here, because this the way I write it, it's typically going to be a row matrix, and I like working with a column. And I'm setting up everything as a column here, so work it, um, that's what I'm going to do with it. Okay? <coughs> All right. Let's see. Um, we have that. We have our solution. Now we're ready to run it. Now what I have to do is plot it. Okay? All right, so here we go. Um, waterfall is a plotting style. Um, X, T, and solution. 
and we should be able to do this. See if it complains. See it complained. Something's wrong. Size X size T size you saw. Ah you solution only has forty. Let's see what we're doing here. So There we go. Yeah, for the leapfrog, it's a little different. Okay, now here's waterfall. There you go. Now, so what you're seeing here is, let me blow this up. Back. Okay, got it. Um, so what you're seeing here is basically uh, the solution. One-way wave equation, and what happens with the wave equation is, uh, actually, I'll zoom in, but twist, rotate right there. is it moves to the left. That's what a wave equation is supposed to do. Uh, it also appears to be growing. Certainly not supposed to be doing that. And not only growing, but generating these oscillations over here. We can look at this more closely if we spin it around. This is an artifact of the Euler scheme. This is completely unreal phenomena. It's a numerical artifact of the of this Euler scheme, which we know to be unstable. That, right there, is unstable behavior. So how do we put a smackdown on that? Because we need to. Well, first, you get your kung fu action going. <laughs> okay? All right, so you got to kung fu this up right over here. See? It's not just celebrities, but you have your great host right there. All right, so let's do this. Now let's do it with, in fact, LeapFrog 2.2. Now this is a two-step procedure, and a two-step procedure means we need two initial conditions. Well, there's a couple ways to do it. One, you could get the second initial condition from using like this Euler method, because you see it takes a while for it to actually go unstable, but I actually know what the next step is supposed to be. It's supposed to be this. Um, because I know the exact solution for this. And that. Was that? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so the exact solution for this is just the wave. Whatever your initial condition is, f of x, the exact solution is f of x plus t. So if I go delta t into the future, that's all I've got to do. Okay? So I'm only going delta t into the future. All right, so there's now two initial conditions. So let's write them both out. First and the second are written out then to the solution vector. And so now when I come here, now I say, well, the leapfrog now is different than this. Now I say I use U2 is equal to U0 plus CFL. Now I have to have the A matrix times um, here I use U1. So here's my past point, my current point, my future point. Very similar algorithm, but now when you update, you have to say, well now, after I've done this, I have to say that um, the order you do this, by the way, is very important. You have to say that, how about making uh, U1 is equal to U2? And the order is backwards right there, right? Because if I do u1 is equal to u2, that overwrites u1 for this next line. So you need it this way. First, you say, okay, now u1 becomes my point in the past. u2 becomes my, my current point. Okay, so u0 is past, u1 is current. So this is how that scheme works. And then when I get u2... That gives me my my current point that I just got from the iteration. And then I just continue through here. Now I go through minus one steps. That's it. What's my CFL right now? 
is one, right? And what I know is true is that this thing is stable for it being one or less. So let's go ahead and run it, see what happens. Boom. Exactly what you're expecting. Uh, so this is what you expect for the behavior. A wave simply propagates to the left. And if you look carefully, let me get a little bit here. You can see, first of all, there's none of that oscillation that's coming over here. The height is the same as it goes. It's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. So in this case, great. We're running it right at the edge of stability. So you could ask the question, so right now where our CFL number is 1, which is allowable, we know it's stable. So you could ask what happens if you violate the CFL number. And we could say, OK, I can easily do that. In fact, let's just, so if I make dt 0.2, my CFL number is now 2. <coughs> and run it. And you can see bad things have happened. Look at the huge oscillations forming behind this pulse. The pulse goes along, and then you just get this huge stuff coming up there. This is a numerical instability. This is now. It's very important that you realize the nice thing about this. If you kept running this, these things would go to infinity and would crash your code. That's usually the hallmark feature of a numerical instability. It's like stuff like this just keeps blowing up. I've only run it to time four, and it hasn't had enough time to take off to infinity. Okay, you keep going, a blow up. So, but it's very important that you know that, right? Because uh, when you see something like this, you've got to be questioning it. I mean, you don't want to say, oh, check it out. This is a cool physics phenomenon. If I take a one-way wave equation and throw in a Gaussian, it creates this huge wake behind it. Okay. No. Okay. And you can easily see this because here's one of the things about numerical convergence. Regardless if you know what the CFL number is exactly, like here, so these, these methods, we know what the stability boundaries are. You're not going to generally know this. You give, if I give you a generic problem, how do you know in a generic problem with nonlinearities, all kinds of stuff going on, how do you know that that kind of behavior actually is actually what's supposed to happen? In this case, I know it's not supposed to happen. So you have that, you have that luxury right now to say, oh, this is crap. What if you didn't have that luxury? How do you know that's true or not? One of the things you always do to check this is you see if it's converging to the value. If I change the dt, cut it in half, and cut it in half, and cut it in half again, I should be getting the same thing. Okay? If you see that as you change dt, you get quite a bit different, especially to the naked eye, you know it's not converged. You know something's wrong. So for instance, here you could say, well, if I cut it in half, I'm down with the CFL number. But keep an eye on this. Look at the scales here. This goes up to about 5. And we've run it to 4. And you say, OK, well, just cut your time step a little bit more, 0.15. You run it, and look at that. It doesn't look like it's going unstable. I run a little longer. So the, I'm st my CFL condition is at 1.5. Okay, let's go run it out to 6 and see what happens. See? It still goes. But you see, right away, that would be an indication to you. If you had a code, you want know, to say, is this a real phenomena? If I change my DT a little bit, it changed significantly when this thing actually occurred. So you know that somehow something's not converging. Whereas if once you get it below the CFL number, the correct CFL number, you know, once you get it to 1, you run it to 6. <coughs> there you go. And you say, well, was that really right? Well, cut your time step down again in half. <laughs> it's not really how you do that. Um, Run it again. It takes twice as long to run. And I 
Oh my god, can you run faster? Can you run faster? And then I need to come out there and kick her off the screen. There we go. Very cool. Alright. Alright, so there we go. So there you go, you have your solution. Now, uh, nothing changed. If you were to look at it, look at the difference between the two, nothing had changed over those six units. <coughs> so now you know you've converged. Now you have a sense of confidence that at least things are okay. Now let's do one more thing here. Come back to here. And you want to see what periodic boundary conditions do? Let's go back up CFL1, and we'll run it for 10, because I think this is cool. <coughs> Take a little bit longer. <coughs> so we zoom, rotate this in. You can see what flew off the screen over here ends up over here. You can see that what flew off the screen over here. This is starting to get a lot of points in there. So you see right away, you know, we're not working with that many points. 200 points, we've cut it up, TT is point. It's not like we have a ton of points, but you can see it, it even something simple like that. Yeah, okay, see it's starting to get off the screen over here, starting to end up over there. A better way to see this maybe would be to, uh, let me take N to be 100 instead. We don't need that. And then I can bring up my DT. Because that, that gives me a dx that's twice as much, so I can take a dt that's twice as much. We're winning. And then let's take the l to be 10, and then watch. Oops. What's my CFL? I thought I had done it. No. That would be why. Okay. Yeah, so you see it flies off. So, you know, this is, again, the power. You see that the boundary conditions have actually done very a very good job. Oh, sorry. Very sh delayed response. I think this is probably the best view there. So you see it comes from here, flies off, comes over here, comes flying across. All right, so there's the one-way wave equation. Enough said about that. Okay? Now, we can take all the structure we've built in this to so far, and we can say, now let's go ahead and apply this stuff to the diffusion equation, which is next one down. Well, the only difference really is, is that now um, we're going to basically do all the same stuff, except now we need a second derivative. Okay? Uh, so the second derivative matrix, we'll just start with the same initial conditions and everything. Okay, so second derivative now, instead of having a structure like this, this A matrix, you have you have ones on the off diagonals, negative two on the main diagonal. So and these are located at one, zero, one. That's it. And then now the boundary conditions are this. You've just changed significantly what your initial condition, what your structure of your equation is. Everybody okay with that? That's this, it's this guy up here, right there. Negative two is on the diagonal, one on the off diagonals. Um, in addition, your CFL definition changes. It's dt over x squared. Okay. Um, Okay, everybody go with that? There's some other little options there, by the way, I give you for printing and, and changing axes and things like that you might want to take a look at for, for future reference in there. So now we have a second derivative. We have our dt, we have our, uh, our x, and so we, we'll start off with the same initial data. And why don't we go ahead and solve this equation using uh, what we have right now, which is just this here, which is our um, uh, leapfrog method. And I'm going to do for the, for the solutions, u0 and u1 are going to be, let's say, just the same this time. 
Okay? Doesn't matter. What the diffusion equation is, just take this Gaussian and it should just melt it down to zero. Okay? So u naught and u1 are going to be the same. We come through here, take the derivative, and that's, that's it right there. Okay. Uh, and I have to have, and actually there's a 2, factor of 2 right there. All right, ready? And let's not even run it this far. Let's run it out to about time 2 and see what we get. Whoa. Now, I don't know if you can see this number over here. Times 10 to the 24. Two units of time. We said this was unstable, right? By the way, this is a characteristic feature of diffusion equations. If you put in the wrong scheme, it's going to kill you. Or another way to say it is higher derivatives, when they go unstable, they're much more emphatic about their instability. Remember before we saw, oh, it's developing the structure on it. Here, two units later, this thing is times 10 to the 24. I mean, this thing, first of all, you know the solution is supposed to go to zero. Second of all, 10 to the 24 is like, you know, it's just this huge blow up. Okay, bad scheme. So now let's go and change it to back to what we had before, which is uh, Euler equation. Uh, actually, let me do, I, I didn't want to do that. Let's say edit and do edit. We'll do again. Okay. So for right now, let's just say that. Uh, Let's come back here and let's let's just go ahead and do. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically copy and paste this. Control C. Control V. And. Comment that out. Okay. So now let's go ahead and redo this again, but now with the Euler scheme. And here's the Euler scheme. The Euler scheme has just that in it times a times, no, that's it. There isn't that in there. And that's that. It's the only difference. And I guess this would be a, a one now. OK, everybody good with that? Here, here, here. OK, good. So now let's do that one. Still blows up. But why is that? What's the CFL number we are using? 10. This is only stable for CFL of below a half, I think, because that's what we had. So you can see we're taking way too big a time steps. And remember, the CFL goes like delta t over delta x squared now. So we really have to drop the dt down. So if I drop it down by, it was 10, wasn't it? I have to drop it down by more than that. Um, I have to get down to that. Now, how much this is going to cost me a lot of extra time. I just said, do this calculation and please take 50 times longer. Okay? So you can see right away what the CFL, what kind of impact it has on you. Because it announces the delta x squared underneath. And to satisfy that means you've got to really crank down your delta t. This is only with two derivatives. Think about if you're doing a fourth derivative problem. You'd have a delta x over 4 on the bottom. So not, please take 50 times longer. Please take, you know, 1,000 times longer. Now, all of a sudden, you, instead of going to something where, like, you're, it's interactive, let me try this. No, let me try this. No, it's like, let me try this. I'll come back after lunch. And then you get one more run in before the end of the day. And then you can set some going overnight. So you see your cycle then becomes maybe I can look at this data a couple times a day. You know? And we're still waiting. And my time is money. Oh, you know what? Why is it? Um, that's a good question. I think there might be something else going on wrong in the problem. So it's decaying, but it's moving. <laughs> I have no idea why it's moving. We've got, we've got something here in the code that's, there's a bug somewhere. You know what you want? It's always fun debugging. 
um, as you know from homework one and homework two, well, well, as you will know from homework two. Debugging is the thing that kills you all the time. I've got all those right, right? Here's my derivative. Those are fine. Uh, no, it should be positives on the on the two sides, negative two down the middle. No, but on the direction, you have the oh yeah, excellent. Good eye, good eye, good eye. Hey, better, better. Excellent. That's really good. In fact, I think we should put a picture of you up here going. Whoo, 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 whoo. Now that that's that's worthy of that. So you send me a picture, I'll make a cut out of you. Sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be a star right here on this show. Was that, was that last time, though? Was, was that, that last time you were in there? With, um, before you changed it? You no, so I, when I changed it to do the second derivative for this case, I, 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 oh, yeah, probably was on there last time, too, which... You didn't touch the position of the diagonal. Yeah. You, you just changed the values on the diagonal. Also, the position, well, so. I don't think you have changed it to minus one for the Euler. Yeah. I had it wrong there, too? Yeah. I think it's, now you, you're running it for Euler scheme, right? Yeah. But I think your diagonal still has one, a positive ones on the off diagonals. Should be minus one. And zero on the diagonal. On the main diagonal should be zero. You still have minus two E1. No, I'm doing the heat equation right now. Right? Euler. Oh, okay, so it's second. Okay. Yeah. There we go. That was it. I think I remember changing it because when I came back up to change the derivative, I came in here and I put in this middle term and I put in the zero and accidentally erased that. But there you go, there's the heat. Now what's interesting is you really need, look how see all this how it looks? Is because my DT is so small that I've, I'm saving all this data. So it just diffuses away like it's supposed to. So this is a stable scheme. But you see, I'm paying a very high price to run it. My delta t has to be tremendously small to make this thing work. Okay, So, um, and that's all a consequence of the CFL condition <coughs> and that delta x squared sitting on the bottom. Okay, And things only get worse, right? I mean, you don't get around that. That is a basic fact of life that you have to deal with no matter which method you use. Okay. Other cool things. Now we're going to solve this equation right here. It's a wave equation called the Longner Schrodinger. Uh, and what I'm going to do is we're going to basically step this thing through forward in time. And simple algorithm to do this is say, well, okay, how would you do this? Well, this is just two derivatives, so this becomes just uh, one half a u. Plus, that just, so that's the absolute value of that vector squared times that vector again. And all this divided by i, and so this is at time of m, and then if you do a, a leapfrog discretization of this, this gives you, you know, uh, u of m plus 1 is equal to u of u of m minus 1 plus this stuff, where the delta t, you get a, a 2 delta t come on over here. OK? So in this case here, you get a delta 2 delta t from here. And when you discretize this, this pulls out a delta x squared. Right? The derivative gives you, if you take a 2 derivatives, it gives you a delta over a delta x squared, which comes in here. And so I'm not going to go through the details of the discretization. Let's just go ahead and just program it up. I already have the second derivative correctly now in there. And uh, I'm just going to give it two uh, initial conditions. Um, in fact, I'm going to give it, yeah, those are fine. And then let's just go ahead and use a, a leapfrog to step it forward. So I'll ki kill this one. Here's my leapfrog. Now I go back to j plus 2 here, and u2 there, and minus 1 there, and bring that in and bring that in. 
So I have that, but now my, my equation is, well, u2 is equal to u0 plus, if you work out what you've got up there, the board, which I have before, and we don't have time to work it out now, you get this, and it's i times the CFL times the matrix A times u1 minus i times, actually, let me print, pull this up together because otherwise we'll go off the screen, i times 2 times dt times conjugate of u1 dot times u1 dot times u1. So that's u1 star times u1, which is mod, the, uh, modulus squared times u1. That's it. Now you've got basically nonlinear Schrodinger solve. Um, I don't know what CFL condition is in this case. Not only a problem. But we can go ahead and through and solve this. Let me bring this up a little to see if I can get away with a little bit higher value of dt. I'm going to run it. And I think I must have, I, um, I don't know if I put any results up. Did I plot any results for this one up here? So I think the last page is 84. Yeah, so I guess, well, here we go. Maybe this is the best way to do this, because this will take a little bit, and our time's pretty much up. Yeah, so you see, it's already giving me warnings. Um, let me just show you what I've done here. And if Will, you can zoom in on here. So these are two pictures here. On the right is running the nonlinear Schrodinger. Uh, so I'm sitting on the left, but with different CFL conditions. Um, or actually, Euler stepping here, leapfrog 2-2 two, two there. So leapfrog works. It's a wave equation, this is. And so you see that the leapfrog actually does well, CF and the uh, Euler does not. And for both of these, I use a CFL 0 0.05. So again, it takes a while. CFL 0 0.05 means I've got to take pretty small steps. So that's easy enough to do, just that you have to wait a while, which we don't have a lot of time to wait. Uh, but you, know, you can see the dynamics. And again, you can see the, what the instability looks like. By the way, I should point out, when this thing starts going unstable, I've stopped it at 6. But if you go to 7 and 8, this thing's blowing up to 10 to the whatever. Huge power, right? So I'm, I've just captured right when it starts to go unstable. Okay? And then when it, and when it starts to go, it just takes off on you. And at least something like this, when you see something like that, it's pretty clear. You, you'd have a hard time saying, oh, that looks like a real physical phenomenon. So in this case, it's really clear that this is a numerical instability. Anytime you see really high frequencies develop, you go, that's bad. It's probably a numerical issue. Whereas, remember, with the one-way wave equation, when we did it first, it looked like it just, especially for the Euler, right, it just looks like it developed this little train of oscillations on the side. And you might come into, oh, maybe there's something there to that. No. Okay, so if you run it longer, you'll see that this train of oscillations all of a sudden becomes starts to become really huge and so forth. So make sure that you run it either far enough. And the typical hallmark feature of the numerical instability is that you see really high frequency stuff develop and get big. All right, that's it for today. We gotta say, I send you off. See y'all later. See y'all next week. <laughs> Have a good weekend. <laughs>